We've looked at, I think, the, a divided UN Security Council and General Assembly. We've looked at the terrible triplets of conflict, COVID, and climate, and the link between security and development. So that has set us up very nicely for the subsequent sessions. And I want to thank the ambassador for waking up so early and also the acting UN resident coordinator. We're really very grateful. And please let's just, uh, where is Martin? Please let's have the ambassador of Portugal and also Shamala join us up front and move right into the next session. So, um, you're not yet ready for another coffee break. Um, thank you. Let, let me just do a brief advert. Uh, in your files, in your folders, um, I think you will find an evaluation form. Uh, it's just one and a half pages. And please, if any of you are going to leave early, please fill them out and give them to our colleague Martin before you leave, because it will help us to actually improve on what we do. So this is it, and we'll usually need it at the end of the conference, but if you're leaving early, please try to fill it out. It won't take long. Thank you. We don't give you any respite. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Manuel Carvalho, I'm the ambassador of Portugal. And um, I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm very happy to be here and to listening to uh, the conversation. Um, I'm slightly daunted because contrary to most everybody here in the room, I never served in the UN. So I, I don't know the jargon. I don't, I never, <laughs> I, I've, I've, quite frankly, uh, in my 30 or so years of diplomatic uh, life, I never entered the UN building in New York. Um, never ever, been in Geneva. Um, so uh, so uh, I'm, I'm a little bit like the, the new kid in the block. Um, uh, and yet I'm asked to chair this, uh, this, uh, this moment. On the other hand, my country is a committed member and participant of the United Nations. Um, as we all know, uh, the current, uh, um, the current uh, Secretary General is a compatriot of mine uh, with whom I have worked earlier in his life and mine. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, 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 we are committed members, uh, we are committed participants, and we are committed multilateralists. So, uh, uh, even though myself, I don't have experience, my country does have it, and uh, we've been involved in this for a long, long time. Um, it is uh, fitting to have this conversation on the very day that uh, the UN completes 77 years. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lucky number in, uh, in some cultures, 77. Uh, and I'd say that, um, that we should sometimes, I mean, sometimes we focus too much on the shortcomings and we uh, forget the, the successes. And I'd say for in those 77 years, uh, the world went through the biggest peaceful transformation ever. Uh, we moved from a 40 so uh, countries world white dominated into a 200 diversified, all encompassing uh, world system. And that was done without war. Uh, there was there were conflicts, of course, but there was no major war between uh, the, the major powers in the process. As uh, my good friend uh, Ayo was saying a moment ago, the UN was not made to take us to heaven, that we have to do ourselves, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, one by one, yes. Uh, but uh, it did help us to uh, not fall into hell. And if you look back in history, you know what hell looks like. And that is precisely what we have avoided in those 77 years. It's non-negligible, huh? um, despite all the shortcomings. But also, also in other aspects, uh, if you think of it, I mean, okay, we, we have 700, 800 
million people food insecure in the world today. That's an awful number that we have to, uh, that we have to, um, to, to I mean, correct, solve, uh, address, redress. But that is 10% of the population. That means for 90% of the world population, there's no doubt there's going to be a meal in the evening. And that is something that, um, uh, that is also non-negligible. For 90% of the world population, and I don't think humankind has ever been in this position, there's no doubt there's going to be food in the evening. So um, that is also a success of the past 77 years, uh, non-negligible, and allows us to speak in ways that we see famine not as something that has, I mean, something that is uh, predestined, uh, predestined to happen, but as a shame that we need to get rid of. So that's, uh, that's a different angle. And that's, thank you very much to the UN. Thank you very much, 77 years. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, we hear about all the, the challenges that we, that we, that we, uh, that we know about. Uh, we just heard about uh, Western Sahara. The Western Sahara lies very close to my own country. We have been steadfast in the support for the UN process. We hope the issue, the problem, to be solved in accordance with uh, international law. And as long as it is not solved, it remains on the agenda. Thank you to the United Nations. Thank you very much. We keep it on the agenda. It is not solved. Um, and we'll have to still continue to address it. Could have been done better, of course, but I mean, that is a consequence of the realities of interest, conflict, uh, power, and, uh, but we still have the address, uh, the, we still have the agenda, uh, the topic on the agenda, and it's not going away. Um, and uh, um, we, um, we have said that, uh, that uh, a lot of conflicts are centered in Africa. Uh, yes, and that is why it is very topical to discuss, as we are doing in this panel, the connection between uh, uh, the United Nations and Africa. Um, because Africa is not only where we have so many conflicts, but also, uh, as uh, for, if you look at the Human Development Index, that is where you have collectively uh, the group of the lowest ranking countries, or a large part of the lowest ranking countries in that human development index. And there is perhaps a correlation, which means that as we look at the challenges that we face, uh, we may have to address them in terms of security, of course, peacekeeping, we, we heard about that. But we also think of um, uh, development and, uh, 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 and human development. Uh, not just measured in GDP, but it measured in the multidimensional uh, uh, form that is the Human Development Index. Uh, so thank you very much for the UNDP for having created that tool. And again, that is part of our UN-created toolbox for which we must thank the United Nations. Uh, and as we, as we speak, uh, United Nations and African Union are cooperating today, I think in this city, if I, if I, if I know the location, because uh, both the UN and the African Union uh, are cooperating in uh, promoting the, 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 hopefully the peace talks uh, in uh, regarding uh, the, the, the conflict within Ethiopia with, uh, with uh, Tigray. So, uh, so it's UN in practice happening today in this city. Uh, again, thank you, United Nations. Uh, I, uh, we, um, uh, we've heard on the, on the, at, uh, at the presentation uh, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, too often focus on the P5, and today we'd like to look at the E10. Um, that is right, uh, that is quite uh, opportune to do. Uh, my country has been a member of the, of the E10 a number of times, and we expect to be again. We hope, I mean, we continue to, in our commitment to the United Nations. Uh, we'll be hopefully back. But, um, but this uh, reflection is particularly topical on the occasion where you have, right now, as we speak, one of the P5 members that is questioning some of the very fundamental principles of the whole international order by invading, conquering, and annexing parts of its neighbor. Uh, and that is a challenge that we never had before. Uh, if we start, and that is, a, that is not a faraway conflict in Europe. This is a fundamental rule of international order uh, that if uh, it gets consolidated, it will provoke general disruption around the world in all continents. Because I can think of many neighbors that would like to seize or chip bits and pieces from 
their smaller neighbors. Uh, it's a very important challenge that it needs to be faced. Uh, and uh, again, uh, as it is coming from one of the P5, it's important that the E10 think about it and also start, I mean, organizing uh, the, the response. Um, we focusing on the United Nations Security Council. Of course, that is part of a bigger whole system, the, including, for instance, the General Assembly, which in this very case has been quite useful in reminding what is the overwhelming, over, overwhelming view of the international community uh, uh, in this uh, very occasion, in this very challenge. Um, I, uh, I'm supposed to chair, not supposed to give a speech, uh, but, um, but I thought that, uh, in a way, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give some, uh, some background and some, uh, some uh, ideas on the challenges we face. Uh, it is my duty to chair the meeting and to introduce the, um, the, my, my fellow speakers. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the University of Pretoria and the Center for Advancement Scholarship and the Nordic African uh, Institute for organizing the session. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce to my left my good friend, or perhaps ladies first, uh, to my right, Shamala uh, Kandia Thompson. Uh, it is very fitting that we have, as we talk to Africa and the UN, we have New York and Africa. So in this very case, I can tell you who is speaking for Africa. It's on my left. Um, uh, and uh, coming from the United Nations, um, Shamala uh, Kandia Thompson, uh, who has been with uh, uh, Security Council report since 2006, the COO, um, served as, uh, with the Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, ASEAN uh, Secretary in Jakarta. And to my left, uh, <coughs> my good friend, uh, Professor Adekaya de Bajo, um, who I met uh, when he was at the UJ at, uh, in Johannesburg, and uh, with whom I've been having quite interesting conversations on Africa in the world and on the world at large. Um, and who is now uh, uh, a, research, a senior research fellow at the Center for Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria. Uh, I'd like uh, to invite, I don't know who is speaking first. Tamala, you go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for, the, for the background, which actually um, moves into what I'm going to say very well and, and for the introduction. Good morning, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to, to come here. The first time I came to Pretoria was in 2018, and it was for the first dialogue of the elected members with the incoming five, which South Africa and Sweden organized. And so I hear who is here was part of that. Um, it has survived five years, and I think the, the concept of the E10 is real now. You know, elected members have always been in the Security Council, but this idea of the E10 coming together is a new idea, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, just to also say that Security Council report was set up in 2005 with a goal to advance the transparency and effectiveness of the Security Council, and a big part of that goal was to, to help elected members with sort of providing analysis and information. Um, you know, we didn't, I think at that time, see how this was going to develop, but it has been very interesting watching that over the years. Um, so we've heard, I think, um, so some support for, for the UN, some criticism of it, and um, I'll start by saying it's been a very tough year for the UN Security Council. You know, I think everybody knows what's happened, and. I think the invasion of Ukraine, it has felt like the UN Security Council has been punched in some ways, as we heard from the first speaker. It's reminded the world that there is a structural weakness in the council. The, the council members have um, resort, not resorted, but gone to the UN Charter, which I happen to have with me. <laughs> I'm very happy that today is UN Day. And although they've you know, sort of gone back to the Charter to, to talk about this in, um, event, this invasion, it has ultimately, there's been a violation of a fundamental principle of the Charter, Article 2, 3, that members shall refrain from the threat or use of force um, against the territorial integrity, political independence of any state. And it's caused deeper divisions in an already divided council. At the same time, it also has been the catalyst for some interesting developments 
in the Security Council and the larger UN system, the General Assembly. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we've seen that the Security Council has adopted this year a resolution, a Uniting for Peace resolution, where the Council can refer a situation when its permanent members are deadlocked to General Assembly. Its significance is that this hasn't happened in 40 years. We haven't seen the Council choose to do this. Um, I think there are questions about you know, how effective the General Assembly can be on this, but it's a change in, in, in something. And two months after this resolution was adopted and the you know, issue was referred to the General Assembly, we saw an initiative led by Liechtenstein um, that has led to the General Assembly now having to meet every time a veto is cast. And it's been used three times so far on a GP arcade um, re sanctions resolution on one reauthorizing the Syria cross-border aid delivery mechanism and on a resolution on Russia's um, referendum on the four provinces in Ukraine. And although, as I said, there are questions raised about how effective the process will be, I think it's brought some renewed energy to the debate over reforming the council. We've heard some references to this, um, both in the film and in speakers this morning. And I think it is um, going to be still a slow process, but that energy might translate into um, a, a slow process in terms of the expansion, but that energy might pr um, translate into smaller forms of reform, and we'll see, we'll see where that goes. What I'm going to look at is really the ability of the Council this year to function, given these developments. And you know, a question that we got asked a lot in February, March is, how is this going to affect um, the ability of the Council to work, um, P5, permanent member relations. And I think you know, there was concern that the Council will not be able to function if the permanent members are not working well together. But they have not been working well together for some time. I'd say for you know, the last 10 years, there have been tensions that have built up since 2011. Um, we've seen the Libya and Syria conflicts um, you know, come into the Council and the divisions over that. Um, we saw that in 2018, the UK and Russia relations were affected by the, the poisoning of a Russian agent and his daughter. Um, in 2020, the outbreak of COVID made it very difficult um, in China-US relations as the source of the virus became a point of contention. So, so th th these difficulties between permanent members are not new. But since the invasion, there has been a clear deterioration. It has, everything has become harder in, in getting things done in the council. Um, and I think there's subtle shifts in the relationship between China and Russia, which has been very interesting. Um, you can see this in some of China's voting patterns, some of their statements. It's a new situation that um, they're dealing with. And the question has also sort of come up as, you know, how, how are other issues being affected? You know, Ukraine is clearly not the only agenda item on the council, but it feels like that sometimes. The world sees just Ukraine, but there are many other issues that the council is dealing with. And they are not, the council is not paralyzed on those issues. I mean, I think they, they have been able to continue to, to function and, um, I think there has been some separation between the rest of the work and Ukraine. So the basic work has continued. For example, there's never, no, no peace operation, no UN peace operation has been shut down as a result of a veto. Um, so far, there have been 25 resolutions adopted this year and um, renewing the mandates of peace operations, sanctions uh, regimes, um, the experts and sanctions committees. 11 of those resolutions were not unanimous, so you didn't get the 15 voting. But again, that's not unusual. In the last few years, we've seen that quite often, particularly on sanctions resolutions. This has been quite controversial um, in the last few years. I, but I think what is more significant is that it's been difficult to strengthen a mandate, a peace operations mandate, and it's been difficult to make major changes at a time, I think, that several of these uh, peace operations um, 
UN peace operations are in situations that are deteriorating. Being able to strengthen those mandates, to bring in stronger languages, has been difficult because there is so much, there's no negotiation that's easy. And you know, some of these issues have been around, but again, it's just been more difficult. So the other thing I think we've seen is that mandates with a strong EU connection have also been more difficult. We were watching to see what would happen with the Libya mandate renewal, and it was there was the threat of a veto used, which led to having to compromise to a point where I think it did weaken some things. Um, on Bosnia and Herzegovina, we've seen difficulty as well. There have been four vetoes this year. We've seen two on Ukraine, um, one on non-proliferation on the DPRK sanctions, and Finally, recently, the Syria cross-border mechanism. There was a veto. It was eventually a resolution was adopted. I find the vetoes on Ukraine and the Syria cross-border not unusual. We have seen, we expected it on Ukraine, on Syria cross-border. That has been quite common in recent years. But not being able to adopt a resolution imposing stronger sanctions on North Korea was a bit worrying, especially at a time where you know the threat of the use of so sort of nuclear weapons is sort of in the air. And it was the first time, I think it marked the first time that the council failed to adopt a resolution on non-proliferation. Uh, both China and Russia argued that this resolution would not resolve the tensions and that further sanctions would have a negative effect on the humanitarian situation in North Korea. But you know, these are arguments we have heard, but actually vetoing it was, was, was a bit of a surprise. There are also a number of press statements uh, presidential statements that have been blocked by Russia. They require consensus. Russia and China have been difficult in getting, you know, allowing for agreement. So they have not shut down anything that is essential to the functioning of the peace operations, but on other things, getting agreement, you know, has become difficult because of the, the consensus needed. Um, for example, on Colombia and Afghanistan, press statements weren't possible on, in some, after some meetings. We've also seen it, um, interestingly, on very protracted um, discussions on procedural matters, um, which may sound maybe not so significant, but they take up a lot of the council's time, but they also have got an impact in terms of things like who can brief the council. If, if Russia has an objection to certain briefers, to certain meeting formats, to being able to have, for example, President Zelensky briefed by uh, VTC, by video, this has been something that Russia has objected to very strongly on the basis that now that the council is back in the in the chamber, briefers from member states need to be there physically. But you know, others have argued it's a little bit difficult for him to leave his country right now. But Russia is still, you know, holding <laughs> that line. Um, we've also seen more talk, and this has again, it's not new, but the idea that. You know, certain situations are best dealt by regional organisations. You know, we've seen sort of council members suggest that the AU is best placed, say, to to discuss Tigray, Ethiopia. Again, not new, um, or that Myanmar um, is ASEAN that should deal with it. There is a sense sometimes that these harder issues in the council are being sort of moved out because they will be stuck there. That perhaps the regional organisations need to. Um, try and address them, which may be okay if the regional organizations <coughs> feel that they are able to, if they have the, the tools for it. And I think that is just a question I'm, I'm putting out there. Um, we, we've also been able to, um, we've seen difficulty in the last few years with sort of new threat issues of, sort of around new threats, like cyber coming into the council. And I think that's still there. but. It's, it's an environment where trying to produce an outcome or um, you know, adopt something on these things would be <coughs> difficult. There's one interesting development that happened last Friday that I want to highlight. I mean, I've talked a lot about how difficult it is to get things done. And that was a sanctions resolution that was adopted, um, setting up a sanctions committee in Haiti. Uh, it w that was interesting because um, <laughs> It established a, a sanctions regime, which established, um, so it, which included a targeted assets freeze, a travel ban, an arms embargo. And it's the first sanctions regime established since Mali in 2014. So it's been some time. And what was also significant is that China, 
who is a well-known critic of, of UN sanctions, was the member that in July, at the, during the mandate renewal on Haiti, suggested the need for sanctions. So it was a bit of a turnaround in the position we've seen on, you know, on sanctions in China. We'll see where that goes, but it was unanimous, all 15 <laughs> um, agreed to it, and now they, they have to set that up. So in a situation where we have seen quite a lot of dissent, there's some, you know, as, as the situation has gotten worse, they seem to have come together a little bit on this, and we'll, we'll see. So coming to the elected members and you know, how the tensions in the permanent mm -hmm. members among them, how that's affected them, I, I think that sometimes in sort of the darkest times, elected members have been able to find the spaces to assert themselves and to make some difference. Um, you know, the, I talked about at the beginning that the E10 came together and the idea of the institutionalization of the E10 has continued over the years, but it's not been easy in recent years to, to have all 10 agree, to be able to issue joint statements and um, take joint maybe decisions on, or try to come up with um, drafts, you know, alternative E10 elected member drafts. But we, in the last few months, we've seen a little bit more of such activity after a space of, you know, sort of four or five years where that's been very difficult. I mean, in 2014, when you had Luxembourg and Australia on the council, they created the humanitarian, humanitarian track on the Syria file where, you know, this is where the um, aid delivery mechanism was, was created. And elected members continued to lead on that issue. Um, and we saw that in 2017, 2018, when Sweden, for example, was on the council, the Syria chemical weapons issue was something that elected members took up and, you know, Syria led in trying to find alternatives at times when the permanent members were really, um, you know, deadlocked on being able to do anything. And I think this year, again, in a time of deep division, we've seen the E10 show a bit more unity. They produced the draft presidential statement after the grain deal on Ukraine. Now, it did get adopted, but for those of us watching the council closely, this was still significant because they were able to agree on this statement. They, they, they had an alternative when one of the permanent members had a draft that wasn't going to be adopted. And I think this is one of the big takeaways that I think certain things coming from the E10 right now would be easier to get agreement on than if one of the permanent members initiated it. So we're beginning to see the effects of, of that and how perhaps working with elected members, the permanent members are beginning to see the value of that even more because of what they, of how they might be able to work with China and Russia on certain things. And I'll come back to that um, at the end. And um, so, so this year we've seen two joint statements on the Syria um, humanitarian track on the um, aid delivery mechanism delivered by E10 members ahead of a vote to show really support to the co-pen holders and, and, and their united position on it. And I mentioned the, the grain deal. And um, we've seen a joint stakeout and um, a joint statement on on the um, education of girls in Afghanistan one year after the Taliban took over. A little bit about the African members. Um, we've heard about the A3, so I don't have to explain it. And I, I really do think they have become a strong subgroup within the E10. You know, in, in some ways, the E10 haven't always been able to agree as 10, but the A3 have been able to issue joint statements. Last year, there were 53 joint statements made, and I think we are on track for a very similar number this year. I, I haven't got the, the full number yet. But last year you had the A3 plus one when St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, joined the African members. And I think there was strength in numbers there. I think they, they showed that they could um, speak with one voice on African issues, but they also did joint statements on Afghanistan, on Haiti. And um, we've seen that when there's a clear AU position, they are able to, to take those um, so joint um, positions. And, and as we've heard already, it is harder when there's a strong African position, a united position for, for members like China and Russia, but also the P3 to, to oppose them. So you're able to get agreement 
on, on some of the African issues this way. But, but the situation with, with Ukraine is more difficult for the A3. And we saw this recently when Gabon chose to abstain on the referendum um, vote. So, so they are, they're not completely united, and I think this you know, is, is showing. I want to just point out a couple of, um, one issue that the A3 right now, they're working closely on, um, trying to get a commitment from the Council on the financing of AU peace support operations. This has been an important issue for the African members for some years. And um, in 2018, Ethiopia put forward a resolution that the US threatened to veto. This was under a different administration, and I think there's a sense that the US might be more open. South Africa took it up in 2019, but I understand that you know, what they, they, they agreed to eventually was that the AUPSC would come up with a common position on the outstanding issues before it was put um, on the table for a vote. And the AUPSC is, um, had, was tasked with drafting um, a position paper, which I believe might be adopted maybe at the summit next year. I don't think it's been finalized. Um, and this issue has really come alive again in the council. We're seeing that um, the, the three African members are working together on this. Gabon has, you know, sort of Gabon and Ghana both with presidencies this month and next month will have um, meetings that are connected to it. There was an ARIA formula meeting in July that Ghana organized on the operationalization of the African Peace Fund, which is connected. And the Chinese organized a debate on peace and security. I'm almost done when um, the issue of financing was raised. So I, I think it's something to watch out for. There's some unity on that. And I think it's something the E10 could have unity um, over. So, and a very, my final point is that I mentioned the idea of how the co-pen holders have been, um, sorry, that the elected members are perhaps a little more in demand now that there, there are greater divisions among the P5. And one area we see this is the area of pen holding, which is, you know, a very controversial issue in the council. The idea of um, and it's not just drafting, um, the, you know, sort of an outcome, but also negotiating it, leading um, on it in terms of calling for meetings and speaking in the council. So, the I, I, we've seen the P3 dominate in this area. China does not have a pen, and the U.S. Oh, sorry, um, Russia has got two, but the P3 have all the other country-specific issues, with the exception of Afghanistan. Um, Guinea-Bissau and the Syria humanitarian, which, come, which elected members have held. But what we're seeing now is a little bit more of the sharing of the pen. And Mexico has been particularly popular as an elected member that all three, P, uh, all three um, P3 members have um, sort of now worked with them as a co-pen holder. And Ireland is acknowledged as the pen holder on Ethiopia. It's been a little controversial because the A3 did react to that. But I think they, they are seen that way from, from what I understand. So something is changing very, so there's a, been some change and we'll see, see where, where that goes. And I'll end with saying that I do believe that the elected members have a role, even in these very difficult times and perhaps an even bigger role. Because I, I, I think they, they are the members who can come in and try to create those spaces and come up with initiatives at a difficult time. And I'll stop there because I know I've run out of time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you were fine uh, in content and form and time. Thank you very much. Um, if I may turn to uh, my left. My left is gone. Okay. Your ideological left, Ambassador. <laughs> um, okay. So my presentation is titled Towards a New Pax Africana the AU, the UN, and the EU. The five permanent members who are uh, mandated to maintain international peace and security actually account for an incredible 76% of arms sales that fuel conflicts around the world. So in a way, they're also pyromaniac firemen, these five countries. The big five have also in some ways come to resemble the characters in Aesop's fable, which I'm sure you all read, as I did, as children. So the US, for example, is like the lion, the king of the jungle, which hunts other beasts. 
The Russian bear, of course, is a Cold War appellation, and the bear and the lion fought over a goat in Aesop's fable. China is the elephant which has big ears. It listens more than it speaks, but it also has a long memory and appears to be hiding its strength to be able to show its power later on. France is the wolf in sheepskin, which hunts vulnerable lamb. And you remember in Aesop's fable that the wolf is deceived by its shadow into believing it's bigger than it actually is, suggesting folie de grandeur. Britain, of course, is the sly fox, which is prepared to betray friends. And we know about perfidious Albion and Lord Palmerstone's famous dictum that countries have neither permanent friends nor permanent enemies, but permanent interests. The games that these five powers play determine peacekeeping outcomes in Africa. And the UN Security Council is the only body that can start and end UN peacekeeping missions. And it's also the only body whose decisions are binding on all 193 members. Since 70% of the Council's deliberations are typically on Africa, and 85% of the 75,000 UN peacekeepers are deployed in African theatres, Africa must necessarily uh, try to increase its influence on this important Council. And as we've heard, the Undemocratic Council's legitimacy has been greatly eroded, and it needs to bring in more members from the Global South, your Nigeria, South Africa, India, and Brazil, to make it a council of 2022, not one of 1945. Africans, for their part, must return to Kenyan political scientist Ali Mazrui's idea of a Pax Africana, which is a peace that is created, cultivated, and consolidated by Africans themselves. Mazrui came up with the idea of continental jurisdiction in 1967 in a seminal study, basically asking meddling outsiders to stay out of African disputes and let Africans resolve their own disputes in collaboration with the United Nations, of course. And it was a kind of Monroe Doctrine, and his idea of racial sovereignty basically argued that inter-African interventions by sisterly African states in each other's affairs was more legitimate than interventions by outsiders. The 15 post-Cold War years that shaped the UN security architecture were also led by two African UN Secretaries General. Egyptian Boutros Boutros Ghali's 1992 landmark, An Agenda for Peace, came up, as we've heard, with a continuum from conflict prevention to peacemaking to peacekeeping to peacebuilding. And it still guides much of the work of the security architecture of the UN and regional bodies today. Boutros also argued very strongly that regional bodies must be capacitated to be able to work with the UN. And the Liberia mission in 1990, in 1993, the UN deployed for the first time alongside the ECOMOG mission in Liberia, which was an innovation. Along with his Ghanaian successor, Kofi Annan, uh, both massively increased the deployment of UN peacekeepers, set up international uh, criminal tribunals for Rwanda and Bosnia, set up the UN Peace Building Commission and the International Criminal Court. So Africa, in many ways, has contributed to the current global architecture. You also had African bodies like the AU, ECOWAS, SADC, ECAS, and the EAC launching interventions into Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, Burundi, Somalia, the DRC, and CAR. But they remain largely financially and logistically deficient. And there seems to be some kind of aristocracy of death where the Africans spill most of the blood 
and the lives of their peacekeepers seem to be worth less than those of others. So what I want to do in this short presentation is to look at the security cooperation involving the AU, the UN, and the EU. First, I try to look at the AU and the UN. Second, the EU's role in Africa. Third, um, I look comparatively at the role of the A3, the African three members and the EU on the Security Council. Then I'll conclude with some ideas on how to revive Pax Africana. There is a pressing need to establish a proper division of labor between the UN and African regional bodies. Relations between the AU and the UN are governed by a 2017 Joint Framework for Enhanced Partnership in Peace and Security. And the AU remains the only regional organization that has the kind of sustained relationship with the UN. There have been 16 meetings between the AU Peace and Security Council and the UN Security Council, as we heard from Ambassador Mabongo in New York. The UN, um, but, but I think it's important to note that between 2000 and 2014, the UN was taken over peacekeeping missions from African regional bodies, again underlining that lack of logistics and finance. The UN took over from ECOWAS in Sierra Leone, Liberia in Mali, and Côte d'Ivoire. It took over from the AU in Burundi and also in Darfur. It took over the ICAS AU mission in Central African Republic. So it's clearly not done enough to strengthen the capacity of African regional bodies. In December 2008, an AU-UN panel led by the former president of the EU Commission, Romano Prodi, made three sensible proposals. First, enhance the strategic relationship between the AU and the UN, particularly their security councils. Second, fund UN-authorized AU missions for six months and then the UN take it over. Third, establish a multi-donor trust fund to finance future missions. 14 years after these sensible recommendations were made, almost none of them have actually been implemented as the UN Security Council's five permanent members basically prefer to wait to see where their strategic interests are involved before deciding selectively where to intervene. So we have a process often of selective security rather than collective security. And you have deals also being made by these P5 members where France will support a UN mission in Haiti in exchange for the US supporting a French uh, mission in Côte d'Ivoire. So those are the kind of games that are played and it's important we understand those dynamics. It doesn't always have to do with where the most need is. The critical security relationship between the AU and UN has also sometimes been rocky. The Security Council and members like the US have always consistently insisted on the primacy of the UN in global peace and security, even in Africa. While the AU and African regional bodies have insisted that due to their local proximity and better local knowledge and subsidiarity, they actually have to play the lead role supported by the UN. So you've had some of these tensions, for example, between the AU and UN in Central African Republic and also the AU and ECOWAS in Mali as well, to do with support packages and all sorts of logistics support. Moving to the EU, I have often portrayed the EU security role of one of an emperor without clothes. Between 2003 and 2014, the organization launched four small short-term military missions into the DRC twice, into the CAR, and into CAR Chad. The EU launched a 750-strong mission into CAR in 2014 with 2,000 French and 6,000 Central African UN troops seeking to stop religious-fueled slaughter. 
France, which accused the EU, its EU partners of shirking their responsibilities to promote global security, was in turn accused by its EU partners uh, of leading a mission that was too dangerous, and they suspected more parochial interests of protecting an unsavory client in a former min mineral-rich uh, former French colony. In 2003, France led a 1,000-strong EU force to conduct Operation Artemis, which helped to protect 20,000 civilians in the Congo's volatile uh, city of Bunia until UN peacekeepers actually took over. But while this was helpful in stabilizing the situation, this, fort, this force had as much to do with Brussels' attempts to find a testing ground for its evolving rapid reaction force at the time. Another 2,000-strong U-4 was deployed to the DRC for four months in 2006 to support 20,000 UN peacekeepers for four months during national elections in the Congo. And that saw wrangling between Berlin and Paris with Germany reluctantly agreeing to lead the force. Following a rebel attack on the Chadian capital of N'Djamena that nearly led to the ouster of Idris Deby in 2006, France again intervened to provide military support to save the autocrat. And it subsequently requested EU partners to provide humanitarian support to Eastern Chad. And again, there was some reluctance in terms of providing this support and suspicions that this was basically France trying to continue its usual games in its chasse garde, in its private hunting ground. But despite this, there has been growing cooperation. There have been 30 meetings, including one recently held in 2022, between the AU Peace and Security Council and the EU Political and Security Committee. So that relationship is also growing. Moving to the African role on the UN Security Council in 2019 to 2020, South Africa took the lead in a council that also contained Côte d'Ivoire and Equatorial Guinea in 2019 and Tunisia and Niger in 2020. In an innovation, as we heard from Shamala, the Caribbean island of St. Vincent and Grenadines worked very closely with the A3. The three non-permanent members now report monthly to the Africa Group in New York, while the A3's quarterly chair liaises closely with the chair of the AU Peace and Security Council to make sure that decisions that are taken by the Peace and Security Council in Addis feed into discussions and decisions that are made in New York on the UN Security Council. And South Africa focused both on silencing the guns and strengthening the relationship between the UN and AU and other regional organizations. Um, and the African countries actually cooperated where they could or collaborated with China and Russia to push back against Western P3 policies in places like Abyei, Burundi, Darfur, South Sudan, Somalia, and the DRC. The current A3 members, Ghana, Gabon, and Kenya, have unsuccessfully pushed for the UN to fund AU-led peace operations, as we heard earlier. And they've also um, backed the AU opposition to often Western-led arms embargoes in countries like CAR, DRC, and South Sudan. During the unilateralist and NATO-bashing Donald Trump administration in Washington, the traditional P3 relationship between Washington, Paris, and London became a bit less cohesive. And you noticed the two EU countries, France and Britain, basically moving closer to the EU in terms of coordinating policies with non-permanent members of the European Union. They had traditionally tried to maintain their veto-wielding status by keeping a bit of a distance from those non-permanent members. The EU had five members on the Council in 2019, just one vote shy of a blocking veto. 
and four in 2020, just before uh, Britain left with Brexit. And the EU also has an annual meeting with the UN Security Council. So that's a relationship that is growing. And 40% of the members of the General Assembly are actually both AU and EU. So it's quite strange that both organizations actually have not coordinated more closely on the Security Council in areas where they could agree. African and EU leaders held their sixth joint summit since 2000 in Brussels in 2022, talking about enhanced cooperation in peace and security. The Europeans have sought to benefit from the fact that Africans are a quarter of the UN General Assembly's uh, population. European diplomats were, however, shocked uh, to discover that in a vote a week after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, nearly half of Africa's 54 states in the UN failed to support the General Assembly resolution sanctioning Moscow's invasion of its neighbor. The relationship is still dogged by a history of five centuries of slavery and colonialism and more recent acrimonious disputes over trade and migration. This is despite the fact that Brussels has actually provided 3.2 billion euros to the AU's African Peace Facility, an impressive 90% of the total. And with military coups in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, and tensions between France and Russia in the Sahel and CAR, these have heightened African security concerns. So let me conclude in my five minutes by saying, it's important to highlight the fact that before the invasion of Ukraine, it was Russia that was challenging French interest in Mali and Central African Republic, rather than regional hegemons, Nigeria and South Africa. Um, Abuja was rebuffed in Bamako, and Tswane suffered a bloody nose in Bangui, suggesting that local powers do not yet have the capability to challenge even a fading Gallic hegemon on the continent. Moscow has come nowhere near establishing military assets such as America's $100 million drone base in Niger, and its $20 billion annual trade with Africa is only 10% of China's commerce. Like France, Russia suffers from delusions of grandeur in trying to act as a revived superpower with the US. Both Moscow and Paris are clearly now second-rank powers compared to America and a rising China. Neither has the economic clout to sustain a major military role in Africa over the long run. If Pax Africana is to become a reality, an anachronistic UN Security Council, as I said, will need to be changed. Its legitimacy has become threadbare, and France and Britain may have been great powers in 1945, they are certainly not great powers today. So we must find a way of having them have a gentle exit from that council. Um, I think it's also important that though half of Security Council resolutions over the last two decades have related to Africa, only 6.5% of these have had a sole African penholder. You have an untenable situation where France, Britain, and the US draft all the resolutions in 12 out of 14 African cases, as if they're continuing colonial spheres of influence. So African and other regional powers must grab the pens from these hyperactive Western trio and become pen holders in more of these African cases as well. Africa's regional bodies also need to be strengthened. You know, you have the AU mission in Somalia, which has done some very good work in stabilizing the place. But again, the logistics and finance depends heavily on Washington and Brussels as well. In pursuit of Pax Africana, a 25,000-strong permanent African standby force, first announced in 2003 and meant to have been established by 2010, must now be urgently established. The 
AU announcement in 2021 that this force has become fully operational is the stuff of pure fantasy and diplomatic alchemy. It's very important that AU members massively increase the $350 million to their peace fund and UN assessed contributions must be used to support regional peacekeeping and this African standby force. So in concluding, Chair, I think it's important to note that things are changing within the African context. As French neocolonialism in its sphere of influence comes to be rejected increasingly, as America's extensive military presence in 20 African countries is questioned domestically, um, as China's military presence potentially threatens its economic interests in Africa, and as Russia gets further embroiled in the Ukraine imbroglio, there's a chance that Pax Africana could upstage Pax Gallica, Pax Americana, Pax Seneca, and Pax Russica. I close with the question that the foremost prophet of Pax Africana, Ali Mazrui, famously posed in the 1960s, who will keep the peace in Africa? now that the colonial powers are departing. I think the question our generation of Africans needs to answer is who will keep the peace in Africa now that the Cold War has ended and another is starting. God bless Africa. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, my left came back with a vengeance. Um, <laughs> And uh, well, uh, I'd like to open the floor for discussion after these, uh, these two presentations, strikingly different in content and style, but complementing each other. Um, and uh, um, uh, I was wondering whether the last one uh, was stimulating or simply daunting. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I do see a hand uh, rising over there. Uh, please, uh, two hands, yes. Uh, can you take the microphone, please? Yeah. Hi. Uh, good, mo good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bramwell Akileng. I'm a, in an intellectual property lawyer in Pretoria. Uh, thank you for the organizers of this uh, discussion. I'm really honored to be in the presence of many ambassadors. I think some of our discussions or some of the issues that we have, they'll be able to answer them. In the UN, one of the most, uh, one of the things that I would like to understand or to know is whether the economic interests of superpowers actually are considered when you think of reforming the UN because man naturally is greedy and Africa is the theater of the greed. Africa has most of the world resources. Most of the wars in Africa are not perpetuated by the Africans. Most of the arms, as Professor Baja said, actually funnel to Africa. Africans cannot even afford bread, yet they can, have, they can have the AK-47s. They, you know, those are the realities. <clears throat> It's very good for the UN to, to always channel some aid in Africa and whatever. But the reality is the main fundamental issues, like do Africans make their own decisions about their destiny? Do Africans control their own resources? Why, why do the totals, the BPs, the Nestle's of the world still control the prices of African products. And that is why you can have these meetings year in, year out, unless the economic interests are used to address the change of the UN. It will be a conference after conference and conflict after conflict. As Professor DiBaggio says, the U.S. has a military complex which has to test their weapons. So there has to be a theater to test them. So perhaps anybody who is from the 
UN or the embassies could help us understand the economic interests. Do they get considered to say, how do you address your economic interests to create a balance in terms of reforming the UN? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall we take a few questions? I think we have one here in front. Who else? Sorry, here. Thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate And thank you for the two speakers who presented the very informative papers. My question is again Western Sahara. Why the Security Council, what explanation uh, Dr. Shamala can give us that only on Western Sahara the Security Council meet on closed doors? Why the Security Council never have a public meeting on Western Sahara that all citizens of the world and everyone who is interested can attend? The second, this mechanism of group of friends informal group of friends that they are not established by a resolution of Security Council, not established by any statutory thing, and it's the one that dictate the resolution on Western Sahara. The so-called friends of Western Sahara has nothing to be friends of Western Sahara. The other thing is the pen holder. Why one force keep like in the state of United States having the pen holder on Western Sahara since the establishment of the Security Council and refuses any amendment from the, P, the E10. Uh, several E10s have been trying to introduce language to the resolution and always the pen holder has been refused this any input and publish it in blue even before the, the, the meeting happened. I thank you. Thank you. Um, I do see uh, Ayo from the, our friend from the UNDP. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, uh, the presenters. I think this is really great. And uh, I just want to contribute to one aspect of it. If you look at the amount of resources that have been spent on humanitarian issues in Africa, if we had dedicated only 50% of it on development, I think we'll be addressing the root causes of the conflict in Africa. So I just want to use the opportunity of being with uh, so many member states here. How can we redirect such resources to address the root causes? Because if you don't do that, we spend so much on military, on this and that, without addressing the fundamentals. It's really where the issue is. And I want to really re-echo the issue. For instance, if we had spent just about 50% of what we have spent on peacekeeping in promoting industrialization in Africa in transforming agriculture that has the potential of generating through backward and forward integration about 3.7 trillion by 2030, and I think it would be a different ballgame. I just want to appeal to member states on how uh, when we meet uh, in the, our respect to whether in Security Council or governing councils of our different UN agencies, I think we need to push more resources into uh, development initiative in Africa and also to preach that we should not allow multilateralism to just die on the basis of lack of fund. Thank you. Very good. Um, last question on this round uh, on top. So can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Christopher Isike. I'm director of the African Center for the Study of the United States at uh, the University of Pretoria. You're, sorry, director of what? Director, African Center for the Study of the United States. Study of the U.S., to make it easy for you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Right, so I, I have a different question, and, and, and I thank Dr. Odusola for that uh, intervention he, he, he gave. When Ali Mazuri asked who will, who, who will bring the peace, um, uh, who, who, who will enable peace in Africa, um, my, my, my different question is really who will prevent conflicts in Africa? Because like Odusola was saying, 
preventing peace, I mean, who will enable, who will enable peace, the question of who will enable peace is like, you know, paying attention to decorating the house, making the house more beautiful on the inside and outside without addressing the structural foundation of, of the house on which the house really rests. Um, so, so for me, I will ask the question of who will prevent conflict in Africa? And I will answer it by saying that it is not this failed system of states we have. Uh, I hear Odusola talk about you know, states coming together and talking. They've been doing that for 70 years. They've done nothing. The answer lies with the youth of Africa. They are the ones who must take responsibility you know, for their future by enabling um, state systems reimagining those state systems that we currently have because they are all artificial, all imposed, they serve no purpose for the people, for the youths themselves. Uh, so if the youths can find ways to mobilize uh, across you know, the continent um, and forge new social contracts that will have meaning for them, um, then we will not be having need to answer you know, um, the, the, this, these questions, because then, of course, we'll find ways to then ensure that these conflicts are prevented. And if we do have, um, and, and this is a question I want uh, Professor Debajo to consider, and I'm sure that that's what one of the things that Ali Mazri was thinking about, that there cannot be peace in Africa without, without good governance. All right? And, and if, 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 we, if we address the problem fundamentally, it means that we must begin to look at how to enable good governance in the continent. Because if we have good governance, most of the conflicts, like Odusola is saying, will be prevented. And if the conflicts are prevented, we'll have stronger state systems, we would be able to reach across one another, and we can have a stronger African Union that will enable us to deal with the rest of the world together. And that, for me, is a more practical way of looking at things. But right now, the state systems are artificial. My answer still remains that the youths, disorganized as we may be, or as they may be, um, will still be the solution ultimately. And if it's not um, allowed to, 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 you know, to manifest organically, it's going to happen in no time through force. Thank you. Thank you. I believe. Um, we have already a, a basket full of questions from resources to uh, the procedures of public debates in the Security Council, um, how we could devote better the resources that we put into our efforts in Africa uh, from solving problems to, into preventing them, uh, and, um, and the role of, uh, of youth as a future for Africa and uh, how you can improve good governance in the process. Uh, I, I will throw this basket to my right and to my left, um, and, uh, and, uh, and you take it from there. Samuel, will you go? Thank you. We get to choose, I think, <laughs> which ones. I think there, there was one addressed directly I to me. So. the whole round. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. But let, I'll start with that one, maybe. Um, on Western Sahara, yeah, I mean, you, you know the situation well and the dynamics around it. I mean, what I'd say is that it's the, 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 whether the format of meetings are very political. It's not, you know, it's not um, just a procedural matter in terms of how, whether you have a public meeting or a closed meeting. And there are ways to get a public meeting through a procedural vote that does not have a veto, but that requires the, the political will of a member to say, I want to have this meeting in public and go through that process. So I think it comes down to, is there a member who is willing to take that forward? It's true that these meetings have been closed. It is possible through that. But I think, you know, the reality is that there's a particular dynamic in this issue that members have been willing to really um, completely contest in, that, in a way that might affect them you know, in, a, in this political way. Um, having an issue that has the permanent members involved is always difficult, particularly if they have a, a strong position on one side. Right? We see this with other issues. Um, the, inf the friends question is interesting. You know, there were a number of other friends groupings that have 
disappeared. And I have actually been trying to trace the friends of Haiti. I'm not sure where they've gone, but I don't think they function anymore. So they are informal, and therefore there isn't a formal mechanism to shut them down. They seem to kind of like, you know, have some, I don't know, natural process of ending. But I, if there was a formal way, you might then be able to say, well, you shouldn't. But you know, this is connected to the pen holder issue, and it's a much, it's a big, a bigger issue. On I, I think, as um, Ade has also, you know, pointed out you do have, the pen holders often have strategic interests. They have often had colonial histories with these countries and it's complicated to, to have them as pen holders. And I think that has come up very um, clearly and loudly in the last year and a half. Whether there might then be a push to, to bring an elected member in on this issue, I'm not sure there hasn't, as you said, that pen has been held very tightly very tightly. No one has been able to, yes, and for very long, and it, it, they, they, they've, you know, led on this issue. So, so, so I think, but I have a question in a way about this because I've seen interest from certain elected members in wanting to take the pen on some issues. And I, I, I think about how to say this. I don't see a rush by African members to take the pen on African issues. I think that if you do want to take, you know, sort of control of your issues in the council, that is one way. But we also know that there are great sensitivities for an African member to take on issues in their in their region. You know, their their AU sort of complications as well. So, so this is something that I think, as African members, you might want to to think about how I mean, it would make sense perhaps for an African member to to be the pen or at least the co-pen to try to influence, but I don't quite see that yet. I would like to, but I, I don't. Um, okay, the <laughs> the other questions were um, I mean I I I don't um, I don't have. I, I feel like on the reform question, I suspect they may have sort of, you know, in terms of the economic interest and if they're considered, I mean, I think that, again, it's a, it, it is a complicated issue where the, these strategic, economic, political interests come into play. And, and, I, and I agree that if, you know, if, you, if Africans want to control their own destiny, they have to start to play that role. Maybe we've seen that now with the A3 coming together and taking these positions. And um, I, I didn't quite go into it, but it is, you know, that interest that China has had in Africa has um, meant that on certain issues on Africa, you have a lot of support from China. Russia has now, you know, come in and showing that. But I think in this divided council, Africa has become very important to all the permanent members. You know, we, we see, well, the US is going to have this US Amer um, African summit in December. I think that's quite a big, um, you know, development and, and the current administration is showing this, you know, a, a difference in its priorities where Africa is concerned. These, this may be a moment to, to take advantage of, of this interest and, and see, you know, what you can do. Um, yeah, and, and maybe maybe I'll let Ade say a few things and let me think about what else I might have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to make two points in response to the excellent questions. Uh, first, in terms of my brother Bramwell's point about Africans taking control of their destiny, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's very important that we not just take resources out of the ground but add value to them and be able to export them. I think it's also important that we create effective regional organizations that can promote regional integration in an effective way as the European Union has been able to maintain peace in Europe at least for the last seven decades among its own members. Um, and I think it's important that we also set up this African standby force to be able to work in a complementary fashion with the United Nations so that we're not always having to be dependent in terms of finance and logistics 
and do things in an ad hoc and improvised way, almost like you're setting up a fire brigade from scratch each time. And in terms of the issue of on good governance, it's absolutely critical, Professor Isike, um, that the link between governance and security be emphasized and prioritized. Um, and that also addresses the issue of the root causes that we talk about. But we should also look at addressing some of the structural problems of the unfair international trading system. Uh, and when we look at the WTO, what the Global South and other developing countries mourn is the death of the Doha development round and the fact that they're not really given a fair chance and fair access, because that is also linked to being able to grow your way out of some of these development challenges that we have. But it is worrying the recent spate of military coups that we see in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, in Chad, um, and in Mali, because it's almost as if we're going backwards. It's absolutely essential that popular participation in development is part of what actually creates a sustainable peace. Thank you. Um, other questions? Or, yeah, uh, well, one from the audience, and then I have Angela that seems to have questions from the online. Uh, but perhaps uh, Liesl uh, from ISS. Thank you. Liesl Lowe from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, ISS in Pretoria. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm from the Institute for Security Studies. Thank you um, for that contribution. I just have a question around pen holdership uh, and a the notion of a big five in Africa, uh, Professor, you have written about this and the Pax Africana and so on. Um, when we are trying to create a more effective African Union, there seems to be uh, two schools of thought. And they, there is a sense that we should get lead nations to actually drive change so that Ambassador no one says, you know, who do we speak to if we want to speak to Africa? If we have a stronger African Union, then a lot of problems will be solved. But like, for example, in the Peace and Security Council, you have the five three-year members and the 10 two-year members. And now um, Nigeria since 2004 has been a member of the Peace and Security Council. So it has grabbed that pen and it's held on to it within the African Union decision making. South Africa has taken another position. I think with Ambassador Nklapo, we've discussed that South Africa steps back every time and says, no, no, let Lesotho or you know, a smaller nation be a member of the Peace and Security Council, we'll step back. What is the answer um, in terms of actually not um, creating a system where you have a kind of a P5 that holds on to power even if they've lost power effectively, but still making sure that the African Union can move forward, implement issues. Um, we've seen Ghana now this year, for example, really driving the issue of unconstitutional change of government sanctions and so on. So, yeah, just a, a question around that uh, pen holdership. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I, I, I'm, I'm presenting some questions from the online participants. Uh, one is from Duduzile Ramela, who asks, why should Africa support or call for reform of the UN? Why are we desperate to get a seat at the table instead of creating our own room with chairs and a table? Is it impossible to do so? And then Ambassador Sylvester E. Rowe asks, this may sound far-fetched or diplomatically untenable, but do you see the A3 taking the bold initiative in the form of a draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine as an essential first step towards a viable peace process? Thank you. Very good. Um, sorry? Ah, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my friend, Ambassador William Schlappel. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Ambassador, and I'm sure you are pulled into one side, but it's, it's okay, thanks. 
this month, Gabon has been the chair of the Security Council, and there are two issues that they brought onto the agenda. One it is the one of financing of uh, terrorist organizations and armed groups. And then the one it was the UNAU cooperation, both of which were addressed by the Secretary General and the chairperson of the AU, which give it a particular profile. Now I'm talking about the principles behind these two sessions. And then you have the process that is taking place. Then you look at the outcome. What does the outcome tell us about this nature, the value of these debates that are brought to the Security Council and the kind of responses that you are getting? What do we do? Very good. <clears throat> well, um, Jamila, would you like to? Sure. Um, so maybe starting with the last question it's a and it's a very good question in terms of the impact of of you know the outcomes of the council um something that members spend a lot of time you know negotiating i i mean i i'd say and i think you you know with the the au un relationship it has um in recent years getting agreement on a communique hasn't been easy um, this year, you know, there was difficulty on language related to um, climate, to women, peace and security and the financing. All issues that we have also seen difficulty just within the council. Um, I think, you know, I, at a certain level, the fact that they were able to, to get that agreement, you know, made members feel that something had been achieved. But the, the impact of that and, you know, where that takes the relationship is a question. I, I, I think that in this um, relationship and these annual meetings, the important development in a way was the informal meetings that they have. And, you know, the discussion this year, for example, was on sanctions, which I found, you know, um, a, a quite a controversial topic right now in the council. In fact, that you could have those discussions. So, I think that we we often do sort of wonder with certain types of outcomes if it makes any difference. You know, a chapter seven resolution that sets up something that you can see what it's done. With others, I think it's a sign of this is where the relationship is. It reiterates certain things, but this is sort of the bread and butter of the council where you'll keep wanting to that. South Africa, every time you've come in, and we, I've seen three, three rounds <laughs> since, um, you know, SCR started, you've brought the AU into the council. You've, you've really um, created those, um, uh, you strengthened those links. Um, the, uh, this meeting started during your time in the council, um, was it 2007 or so? Yeah. And, and I think that there is something in the fact that you're no longer just talking about working methods, more procedural things, but you are talking about more substantive matters and that is, is there. On the, on the other, you know, I, I think Gabon and we'll see with Ghana, it's been quite interesting what they're trying to do in, in bringing in the financing um, issue in these different forms. So, so I think that it, 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 it sort of is laying the groundwork. It sensitizes uh, members to, to something that I suspect we will see coming up in a stronger way in the early part of next year. So, so it's not a one-off thing, I feel, what they're doing. It, it's, it's meant to, to add up to something. And sometimes that's needed with a more difficult issue. So, so I think there's a strategy in, in place for that. So, so I, I, I do think that it, it is not always possible, especially when the council is divided, to get strong outcomes. But I think a record of certain things can still be useful, I think is, is my shortish answer. Um, on the pen holderships, 
I, 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 correct me, I mean, I, you're talking more about the AUPSC, right? So I am not as familiar, I'd love to know more actually about it. I, I know too much about the pen holderships in the council, but it is very interesting because it sounds like you have similar issues there. And I, I suspect it's the same thing where, you know, the pen may not easily move when, when things have changed. But, um, and I don't know whether um, Ade has maybe more he can say on that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in terms of the question that my sister Liesl has asked, for me, the action isn't really in Addis Ababa. The action is in New York. The AU is there to provide legitimacy, but clearly does not have the financial, the logistics, and sometimes its members are themselves involved in some of these conflicts. So it's better to use the impartiality and convening power of the UN we heard about, um, and also benefit, hopefully, from its greater resources. So I'm not trying to dismiss the AU or what happens in Addis as unimportant, because the AU Peace and Security Council has been one of the few success stories of the AU, if we're going to look at it. But for me, you know, it's reality that the countries that account for 60% of their sub-regional economies, like Nigeria and South Africa, and have played much of the peacekeeping and peacemaking role, over the last three decades be actively involved at both the AU and the UN level. But for me, the more important level is the global one. And I think Ibrahim Gambari, a former Nigerian foreign minister and a permanent representative at the UN for nine years, made a very sensible proposal that before UN Security Council reform happens, why not reserve one of the three African rotating seats for these countries, Nigeria, South Africa, Algeria, DRC, Ethiopia or Kenya, you know? And so that you have consistently strong African representation on the council, if part of the problem, as I believe it is, is because small countries basically don't have the capacity to be able to cover the work of the council. So that is one kind of interim solution that we can use. But for me, uh, Sister Liesl, the what happens in Addis is really less important for me than what happens in New York. And it's there that I think we need consistently strong representation. And if I link this to Sis Dudu's comment or question, you know, as long as the UN has deployed 85% of its peacekeepers in Africa, as long as 70% of its discussions are relating to African issues, and as long as we don't have the capacity to be able to resolve those issues on our own, the UN can simply not be ignored. Uh, that's my response to that. Sorry, I could answer one more question. I, I missed that, um, about whether a draft resolution on an immediate ceasefire I don't think so, is my answer, because it is, um, there, there is, I, I, I think, I, let me take that back. Anybody can draft a resolution and put it on the table. I think there has to be that willingness. And it does not, I don't see the A3 right now focusing on that. They, they, they are focusing on other issues. So I think it would be, it would be possible, but I don't see it happening. Um, thank you. Um, I will not presume to try to uh, draw conclusions. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that, uh, that is stimulating and where we do see uh, developments. For instance, uh, the, um, we see on the one hand the challenges that we face given the situation, uh, given the, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine and how it reverberates across or throughout the the system, including the United Nations and, uh, and in Africa. Um, uh, we uh, were reminded of the, of the general aim of a Pax Africana, where Africa would be able to uh, manage uh, and solve its own uh, issues. 
even though I'd say that we also heard uh, that uh, s some contribution from outside is not all bad. We heard, for instance, that uh, the European Union funds a large part of the uh, African um, operations. Um, so, I mean, cooperation is, in a broader framework, can be and should be a positive, uh, positive uh, thing. Um, we had uh, references to the importance of good governance and or whether the resources that we put into humanitarian uh, efforts should not be put better into uh, development uh, efforts to prevent the conflicts. We had general references to the role of the African Union and, uh, and uh, how the African Union has, despite all the challenges, been able to start uh, playing a role uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, as an interlocutor and complementary uh, uh, force to the United Nations. Um, and uh, um, and uh, we've heard uh, different views on the questions of, uh, on the contribution that different countries in Africa can, can, uh, can give. And we heard about uh, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Ghana, Gabon. Uh, so, um, uh, and there's a, a growing role uh, of the African countries in this uh, general conversation. Uh, structured around uh, uh, A3, uh, and perhaps it is premature to think that the A3 could draft a resolution and submit it, but um, the mere fact that the question was asked is a good sign that, I mean, not now, but perhaps later. So uh, there's, a, there's a future. And as we come to this, um, I think uh, it's time to, uh, for me to talk about coffee, and I don't mean coffee, Anan. Uh, I mean coffee because I understand we have coffee outside. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for the participation and for the lively uh, uh, debate. Um, and uh, to uh, the speakers, to my right and to my left, Shamila and uh, Ade, thank you very much for those stimulating thoughts. Uh, and I will keep the, in memory the notion that uh, America is the lion, China is the elephant, <laughs> Russia is the bear, the fox is the UK and the French are the wolf. I, I'll keep this in mind. I use this. Uh, I, 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 I may use that. I have that. one for Portugal. I'll let you oh. know after. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, we, we, I mean uh, but there's one thing that, there's one thing that uh, between the two of us, uh, um, uh, we do share uh, something together uh, because my dear good friend, Adeka de Bajo, is proudly from the, the great city of Lagos. And I also spent a large part of my uh, youth, uh, young years, in the city of Lagos, one in Nigeria, another in Portugal. But we do share a city between the two of us. Thank you very much. Let, let's come back in 15 minutes, please. Coffee is outside.